Thank you for having me today. I think these these conferences online are really important to the future of investing. Investing is getting more difficult in many areas and very simple in other areas. And I think what the area I'm going to focus on today is Bitcoin. Uh, I, I'm no longer with oil and gas, but I'm using that expertise and tax structure for Bitcoin mining now. And I'm going to go through my thesis of how I came to Bitcoin. And before I start, it's always important, be vulnerable on things. Ten years ago, I was given a slot on a stage to talk about Bitcoin. I was given three days notice to study Bitcoin and give a presentation. It was the worst presentation you'll ever hear in your life. <laughs> and uh, it was terrible. And I completely disregarded it for at least another, I don't know, geez, six, seven years. And then in 2020, right around the time Michael Saylor and some other big, big names got involved, uh, we had time during 2020. So I'm a bit of a historian and I started digging through and seeing what's there. So I'm going to run everybody through a Bitcoin basics boot camp in very simple form. Perfection. Thank you, Eric. You got it. You got it. So thank you, everyone. A little bit about me, uh, my background. I've been in very high tech stuff most of my career. I'm a multi-time uh, entrepreneur. Plenty of successes, plenty of fail failures. I spent a bulk of my career learning complex things like patents and technology to explain it to the investor world. Uh, like Sarah said, I'm a macro macro guy. Uh, I have a free podcast. Doesn't cost you anything called The Rice Report on YouTube and Rumble. Uh, now on TikTok Live. And uh, I do this stuff because I love it. I just I love the game theory. Uh, but my last business was oil and gas. I went into that for a specific reason. I think it helps the country. We need oil and gas. People need tax benefits. You need cash flow and returns. And along the way, I realized the intertwining between Bitcoin and oil and gas, which I'll, I'll get to near the end. So what I plan to do for us here today is run through my thesis in very simple people terms. There are so many people in the world that will explain Bitcoin in the most complex algorithmic language that unless you're a developer, you're really not going to understand, which is why this saying is so important. Bitcoin literally is everything people don't know about computers combined with everything they don't know about money. And money is a topic we don't talk about. My podcast is that three topics, money, politics, and religion. The, th the three things you're never supposed to talk about, I talk about four days a week um, and it's fun and we should all do it because it's a great conversation. But before we can get into understanding what Bitcoin is, we have to have a, a basic understanding of the history of money. This is so important. No one takes the time to do this, myself included. Before I start this section, I would adv highly advise getting a book called Thank God for Bitcoin. It does a very good explanation of the history of money and also the Bitcoin standard by safety. And these are two Bibles in the new version of the financial system, which is certainly on its way. So the history of money. You can date back to 9000 BC when people started bartering. So if you had something and you needed something, you could trade it. Eventually, they started getting into shells and rocks, and it was always based on something that was scarce. Value is created by scarcity. That's a, a format that we have long forgotten in this century, that value is always created by scarcity. So shells, rocks, stones, statues, crafts, these things were all made as money. Eventually, they started finding metals. Uh, around 700 BC, and eventually metals were difficult because they were just a clump of silver or a clump of gold, and you'd have to go to a merchant who would have to have a scale, and there's no way to divide it, so you'd have to buy more goods. And eventually, the merchants started tipping their scale and robbing from customers. So the government, as governments always do, comes in and says, we'll fix this entire problem. And they created standardized coins, which ultimately got clipped. They started taking pieces of the coin. They started minting gold with copper and making it look like gold and keeping the gold. Should sound familiar to today, today's world. And then they invented paper money and they backed it by gold, which no one can actually verify or prove that any government has. No one's ever actually done a full audit. And then the Bretton Woods system came in in, the, in, the, in 1945, right after World War II. And that system was designed completely around partially backed money. And in 1971, we went on full fiat standard, meaning that our money right now is nothing more than a debt instrument of a central bank who is a private corporation and actually not part of this country. So the advent of money, the understanding of the history of money is crucial to understand why Bitcoin exists as we go, th go through some of the basic uh, properties of, of Bitcoin and money itself. Now, this whole process has led us into coin clipping, gold backed money. And now we have just excessive money printing. 54% of the money supply that exists in America today has been printed in the last six years. With the drop in interest rates yesterday and the irrational exuberance happening in the market today, uh, I anticipate them at least trying to print anywhere between four and six trillion dollars over the next 12 to 18 months to support multiple foreign wars 
and a lot of unfunded liabilities from the government. So this is a really big problem to focus on, especially as an investor. There's investments you make, there's cash you hold, and there's there's cash equivalents that you hold. And I view Bitcoin in my, my thesis as a cash equivalent. So after understanding the history of money and just how how bad it gets, because it starts out peer to peer and it ends up being government regulated and fully centralized, and then that centralized authority has ultimate power. So so power always corrupts. You know, absolutely right. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And so in the 1980s, a group of developers uh, called the Cypherpunks created a manifesto. They started working on computers in the original era of the internet. Uh, the manifesto they wrote is actually interesting if you have a chance to read it. It's basically a bunch of guys who worked on a computer who were fed up with the real world and with governments in general and the way money worked. So they started using computers to interact with one another and create forms of currency using a new technology called cryptography. Now, this is this is something that went on for the better part of 20 years. I think most people think Bitcoin just started. It just popped up out of nowhere. There were 40 to 60 attempts to create peer-to-peer e-cash uh, over, all throughout the 90s and the early 2000s. But I think the financial crisis of 2008 really opened people's eyes to the fact that, wow, the government can just print money while we have to work for it. So on October 31st, 2008, uh, an unknown person under a pseudonym called Satoshi Nakamoto wrote a white paper at MIT about how he thinks you could build a successful peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash network which after the course of a year and a half of developing, by the way, all the emails exchanged between the developers are now public knowledge. So we're kind of getting through that mystery of who created it and who's behind it. But it launched on January 3rd, 2009, right in the middle of a financial crisis. And it was designed originally to be a peer-to-peer -peer money network. But again, what is money? Money has distinct properties. And, and, and the conversation of what is money, uh, this gentleman named Robert Breelove has a great podcast called What is Money? And they talk about all kinds of different things. And money has specific properties. It has to be durable, portable, divisible, fungible, scarce, verifiable, and have a track record. Now, two other components have been built into this properties of money model over the past couple of years. And that's censorship resistant and smart or programmable. But as you can see on this chart, I'm not going to walk through that. I've got to condense uh, years of research into Bitcoin into 40 minutes for you. So I'm going to try to be as concise and clear as possible uh, and really get to how it works. I think if you understand how it works, it removes the complexity. But if you look at durability, gold, highly durable, fiat, paper is moderately durable. Bitcoin is digital. It's very durable. You'll find out that Bitcoin fits the criteria of the property of money better than anything else in the market, especially divisibility uh, and portability. So gold, I love gold. I started out on this journey in 2019, realizing that we're heading into a market crash of some sort, which is going to happen either later this year or next year. I'm, I'm, I'm certain of that and I'll show you the stats. Uh, but how do we get, uh, what's the off-ramp? I was looking for an off-ramp from centralized money, centralized currency in general, and gold is where I went first. And when I started realizing that you could have all the gold in the world, uh, but in order to sell it, it's not very liquid. And at the same time, in order to sell it, you've got to have a van or a truck and you could get robbed wherever you go. And that's where I really found Bitcoin is a, is a better version of gold or digital gold. Uh, but it's important to understand the properties of money. And if you want this presentation, it's very simple, but uh, we can certainly mail it to you afterward. So the money problems that exist, we live in a centralized system. We have a central bank, which we talked about, that has basically three main purposes. A central bank is supposed to manage the money supply, which they're not doing. They're inflating the money supply, creating inflation. They're supposed to manage monetary policy, which changes by the minute. Uh, it's not immutable and it requires no voting. There is no voting. It's centralized. When they want to change monetary policy, they change it. You just saw that yesterday. A small group of men decide to low raise or lower rates based on their poor performance of distributing money to the world. And it just happens in a silo and they tell you later. That's centralized control. And transparency. Uh, the Federal Reserve has never been audited. 111 years, 111 years has never been audited. What they produce, the product this private corporation produces to this country is currency, fiat currency, pieces of paper saying you owe us money later. And this creates a constant debasement of your value. In fact, most, most of the things that we invest in, especially tangible assets, they don't actually go up in price. The value of our currency depletes. So it costs more to buy the same thing. And the thing that people overlook is that it's very easy for a centralized authority to confiscate or censor your money. Uh, they confiscated gold in 1933. That was Roosevelt. 
Uh, last year, they enacted a, a, a system in this country that most people don't even know about called Fed Now, which they tell the general public is used for them to be able to make faster payments 24 hours a day between banks. But if you read the actual bill that was passed, you'll find out that right now, every single three-letter agency in this country has full access and transparency into your bank accounts, trading accounts, and everything else. And we've seen censorship with the Canadian truckers and multiple people around the world where governments basically say, we don't like what you're doing, we're freezing your accounts. These are really big threats to your own sovereignty and your wealth that most people don't pay attention to because life is so busy. That's kind of why I exist in this world as a podcaster. And now we're starting to see that our money system is not really secure. Uh, all of our name, address, and social security number was just hacked two months ago. So right now, every single person on this call today all of your information is now on the dark web and can be used by hackers. And we've already seen about a 30% uptick in identity theft since then. So the bottom line is centralized control always requires trust. You must trust the human beings involved who have absolute power that corrupts absolutely. Best way I can explain centralized power. So Bitcoin is the solution. It is certainly a solution. I think it's the solution. First and foremost, it's a, a series of open sourced protocols. Open source, meaning anyone can see it, it's totally transparent, anyone can see that. And the protocols are set and designed to be voted upon. So the way that Bitcoin works today is completely trustless. There's no human being involved in the actual transactions or documentation or ledgers. And more importantly, to make a change in Bitcoin, you need to have consensus, a vote. Now, the world, I, I don't anticipate Bitcoin changing in a big way ever uh, over hundreds of years because human beings have a difficult time determining uh, who they want to vote for in an election, yet alone their own money system. So uh, I look at it from that way. It has a finite supply. It's extremely scarce. There are only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be created. Almost 20 million have been mined and released to the, to the market today. By the way, every Bitcoin breaks down into 100 million divisible units called Satoshis. So you don't need to buy a full Bitcoin, just get some, of, some, some Bitcoin. It'll, do, it'll serve you well. It certainly acts as digital gold. It's highly liquid. So Bitcoin is far more liquid than gold. You don't have to transport it anywhere. You can push a button and you can, you can liquidate and get cash in your bank account that day. But the properties of digital gold, I'll explain a little bit later near the end. It's important to remember that gold was used as a currency and then it was used to back currencies. So digital gold has many implications. The most amazing part of Bitcoin, I'm not, I, I'm not really much, I, I came to, Bitcoin myself, the, the currency, by understanding the system and how it derived its value as a currency. So the system itself is immutable. So once a transaction occurs, it's verified in a thorough process to make sure that nothing is double spent or any counterfeit. Once it goes on the ledger, it's there forever. No one can go back in and change a transaction or steal from you. So this large, immutable, open source, visible to the public ledger of the way money is moved around the world is very important to sovereignty now and in the future. And it's audited. So Bitcoin is audited literally every 10 minutes. So a Federal Reserve never audited in 111 years run by human beings you have to trust. Now you have a system that's fully transparent, audited every 10 minutes, uh, and it is, it is trustless. The money on the system cannot be censored. It cannot be confiscated. It is highly secure. The mining process, which I'll explain with a cartoonish uh, illustration, uh, creates a the most impenetrable digital wall that exists on Earth today. It is literally the world's, world's largest supercomputer. And uh, that security creates a lot of value and it requires consensus for change. Very important to understand. So let me preface this before I get into Bitcoin by saying I'm talking about Bitcoin, not crypto. Uh, there's a reason they call crypto altcoins. They are an alternative to Bitcoin. Bitcoin works on a system called proof of work. Uh, and, and I came to Bitcoin because I was a gold person. And I said, why would I buy any coin that you don't have to mine? You know, all things of value that are considered commodities, which Bitcoin is, are mined. So if you don't mine it, it doesn't have any value. Uh, proof of work is a meritocracy system. It is a democratic system where everyone contributes and produces the end result. And everyone who does mine and contributes to the system actually has skin in the game, whether they've bought the currency with cash or they've bought mining units and are paying an electric bill to mine in the system. Everyone has skin in the game. And the way it works, which I'll explain in a minute, is designed for a perfect incentive structure. Almost everything in the world should work on this type of incentive that wants to be successful. 
It has the highest security in the world, and it has a true fixed scarcity behind, behind the exchange of value, which simply hasn't existed on planet Earth, at least in our lifetime. So it is rules without rulers. The, the hardest concept to understand is that Bitcoin is decentralized. We live in a centralized world. The government makes money. Insurance companies make insurance. They work with them. Everything is centralized. It's controlled by a few, used by all. Decentralized means controlled by all, used by all. It is truly the idea of freedoms for money for we the people. Uh, Bitcoin is a is rules without a ruler. There's no CEO, no investor, no venture capitalist, no board of directors, no human beings that can corrupt the system, no foundations, no insiders, no office space, no website, no marketing team, no executive team, and no central control mechanisms. Uh, it is truly decentralized. It is literally the only and first truly decentralized system that humanity has ever seen, uh, which is which is rare and difficult to understand. Track record, just some highlights before we hop into it. So the, again, first and only truly decentralized money, first commodity, digital commodity with full legal clarity. The SEC has gone through this with Bitcoin for 10 years, full legal clarity. Uh, fastest asset in human history to a trillion dollars. It's now more valuable than Berkshire Hathaway. The most successful ETFs in the history of the stock market have all been Bitcoin. The adoption rate right now is picking up to be faster adoption than the internet when the internet came out. And it is the world's largest uh, computing network that we have ever seen. Hash rate, which I'll explain in a minute, creates kind of a force field of security around the system. And it is the hardest money on earth. But how does it work? So before I explain how things work, I've got some good definitions in here for you. Decentralization, again, controlled by all, used by all, not controlled by a few, used by all. Cryptography is a way of using coding or mathematics to ensure that a lock and a key fit perfectly. If the lock is, if the key is even slightly off, the lock will not fit. So it is, it is a system designed to create privacy. This was the premise behind the entire movement towards digital money is to have privacy involved with your transactions. And then there are nodes, which I, co I commonly call quality assurance. Uh, nodes are essentially computing units that hold the entire Bitcoin network on their computer. I run a node in my house. If, Bit if the power went out tomorrow, I in my home could reboot the entire Bitcoin network right where it was when the power went out and get it right back online. My single computer, my laptop could do that. Truly decentralized. And then you have miners who I call quality control. Uh, these are the folks who confirm the transactions and, and assist in the auditing with the node holders. And they are incentivized to continue creating homeostasis within the system. And of course, the term blockchain, people confuse this and make it difficult. It's a ledger. It's a public ledger run on a digital system. It's just a recording of all the history that's happened within the system that cannot be changed. And all of that creates value that drives value to the hardest money on earth, the BTC, Bitcoin. The system creates the value for the money. It's not the other way around. So what are Bitcoin miners? They are transaction validators. And I'm going to get into an illustration. I have three of them that I'm going to show you because I want to make Bitcoin mining is the most difficult thing to understand. And most people have no idea what a Bitcoin miner is or what they do. And I hope to make that easier for you here today. So essentially, Bitcoin miners validate transactions. Uh, they get a new block that they compete for every 10 minutes. The way that they compete is pretty simple. You have a computing unit and you have Bitcoin. When a new block comes out, it has a very difficult math problem or a password that's associated with it. So millions of computers around the world are competing to solve this difficult math problem. They're literally making 200 to 300 million guesses every 10 minutes to try to win a block. And that combined computing power is right now, six, this morning, 641 exohash. That is the equivalent of pretty much the entire energy of any major nation protects and, and maintains the system. This is truly a vault uh, for money. And the incentives right now for a Bitcoin miner, so if they, if they win the block, they verify, they do their job, make sure that everything is good. They get paid by Bitcoin, by the system, 3.125 uh, Bitcoin per block, plus transaction fees. This is not a small industry by any measure. Last year, the Bitcoin mining market made $65 billion in profits. So again, the process, every new block has a password. Now they have to make millions of guesses. The winner validates the block. The nodes verify the block with them. Then the block is placed on the chain and incentive is paid out. And, and miners do work in pools to increase the odds of them getting paid because you could mine forever and never actually win a block. Now, how it works, I can say that with words, but I think that illustrations are very important to have. So the way that I think of the Bitcoin network, the system itself, and I tried to make this super easy, you'll never hear this anywhere else. I think of the Bitcoin system like a factory with an assembly line. 
So you have a box, a package, or a block that is being filled with transactions that comes out with a password and a difficult math problem to solve. Every one of the miners in the world is competing, increasing hash rate to be able to verify or validate that block. Eventually, one of them wins. So now they have this box that's filled with goods, just like in an assembly line. The package is full. Someone filled the box that goes to quality control. Quality control verifies in the system that every single transaction is legitimate, that every cryptography key matches, and that there have been no counterfeits. Basically what a central bank should do with every transaction, but doesn't. And when they win that block and they validate, they then have to send it out to all the node holders, all the decentralized computing units that follow the same code. And if the if all the every single one of the nodes out there approves on the system, if every one of them agrees that this is now a perfect transaction, then the Bitcoin miner gets 3.125 Bitcoin from the system, fresh new minted Bitcoin. These are going to be extremely valuable in the future, but there's also transaction fees that the Bitcoin miner makes. So another way to think of it is very simple. People mine, you have the box with the filled with transactions. You verify that everything in that package is good to go. You quality control, quality assurance, put it on the blockchain. It's now immutable and recorded forever. And then there's an incentive paid. This is what's called proof of work. You must do work and contribute to the system in order to get the incentive. Uh, this is truly the way businesses should be run. So miners get paid, right? That's, that's an important process. If miners didn't get paid, there would be no Bitcoin in the system. Unlike crypto, Bitcoin has never been given away. Everyone, every single Bitcoin on the market or that will be released in the future, someone had to spend money on energy, a computing unit, and spend a significant amount of time mining. So every person who's in the system has actually been rewarded for their merits. And their merits decrease over time. So as the network effect right now, again, the network effect of Bitcoin is the largest supercomputer that the earth has ever seen. This network is growing and expanding and further decentralizing down the road. But the thing that happens every four years, now there's a mathematical way to do this, but they work out to be every four years, the incentive for the miner who does the work to make sure that everything is good, their incentive gets cut in half. So I'm sure at least earlier this year, you heard the term having, and most people don't know what a having is. A having is once you've reached a certain point, the minor incentive gets cut in half. Now, this is a perfect system in incentives because as the incentive gets cut in half, the price has escalated. So as you can see in 2009, when Satoshi was mining uh, blocks, he was getting 50 Bitcoin for ev you know every time he mined a block, he got 50 Bitcoin. There were 7,200 Bitcoin going into the market every day back then with, with a price of less than a penny. Fast forward to 2024, where we are today, Bitcoin miners now get 3.125 Bitcoin per block. There are only 450 new Bitcoin that cr get created a day. That's it. There's only 450 and three years from now, that's going to go to 225. But the price has escalated from less than a penny to $62,000. That is the top performing asset in the world over the past 15 years. Now, the timing for understanding a system like this couldn't be better. This is a liquid product, a money, a store of value. It's easily transferable from one person to another. It takes a little learning to know how to do that, but as a way of storing capital. So a lot of folks right now are using Bitcoin as a holding cell, earning, earning their upside on Bitcoin and then deploying that capital into you know, homes or real estate or oil and gas or, or stock. But the timing is perfect. With all the geopolitical unrest, and I won't get too much into that today, uh, as you can come to my podcast, I do it uh, three or four days a week. You know, it's, geopolitical unrest is a big thing to think about. You know, We have the verge of war. We have a, uh, a multiple wars around the world the, on the verge of us being involved in one of them, in my best estimation. And along with that, we also have an election season coming up, creating more geopolitical unrest. I'm sure all of you have a TV, the internet, or a phone, and you realize how much tension there is in this country. And in the middle of this, we just saw a 50 basis point drop in the federal interest rates. Now, the last two times they dropped 50 basis points was 01 and, and, and 08. Both of those, those two seasons, uh, those two drops at 0.5% produced uh, in 2001, a 39% decrease in the S&P 500, along with the 2.5% increase in unemployment. In 2008, it was a 53% drop in the S&P 500, correlated with a 5.4% uh, uptick in, in um, unemployment. These are, these are things that are coming down the pike. These are pretty mathematically solid. 
but dropping interest rates guarantees that it's cheaper for the government to borrow money from the central bank. So you can guarantee that more money printing is coming, which is going to debase your currency all over again. So a whole new cycle is coming. And we are now thir almost $36 trillion in debt. And in the last two days, we've actually printed or borrowed $82 billion as a government. So the debt spiral ultimately ends up creating bank runs uh, and bank failures. These are big things to track. I'm going to show you a chart at the end. Uh, and ultimately, bank bail-ins, which most people haven't heard of. I talk about it a lot there. But uh, these, are, these are laws that are set. You can't bail out banks anymore. Give them free money to make sure your money is safe. A bail-in now, per the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, essentially says that, well, your money is actually debt to the bank because they owe you money when you give it to them. So a bank bail-in is when a bank converts debt to equity. So instead of getting your money back, you get a stock certificate for a failed bank. This is not a theory. This has happened in Cyprus and Malta. It just happened in Cuba. Uh, these things will happen throughout the, the course of the next year. Plus, we live under a very large state surveillance. So everything we do is watched. I just explained Fed now, and it's easy to censor our money. And we're already living in a deflationary uh, in, e economy with Bitcoin. So my home I bought for $750,000 four years ago. I'm in Texas. So if you're in California, you're like, wow, how'd you get a house that cheap? Uh, back then, $750,000 would have cost me 43 Bitcoin. I can now sell my house for almost double that amount for 21 Bitcoin. So while everything else is getting inflated, Bitcoin is scarce and fixed, and it's deflating against buying power of any currency in the world. At the same time, we're seeing uh, supply. Uh, supply is always an issue. This is a commodity. So in, in supply, it's important to note that 71% of all the Bitcoin in the world has not moved in nine months. It is being held in cold storage. Uh, this is, I always thought Bitcoiners were crazy, right? This is, a, this is their, their community and they just love it. Once you understand it, I, I also have not moved Bitcoin in two and a half years. Uh, I just keep accumulating. I don't sell any. But more is also being taken off of the exchanges. So right now, what most people know is they go to a Coinbase or a River. I would advise River or Strike. Those are the two best Bitcoin exchanges with great fees and great service. Uh, people are go there to buy Bitcoin because, again, unless you're a miner, you have to buy Bitcoin from someone else. They can't be created or counterfeited. Uh, but the exchange rates right now, they're, they're projecting at the rate of purchase through pension funds and ETFs and all these other things that the exchange uh, supply will actually deplete to next to zero within the next nine to 12 months. At the same time, only 450 Bitcoin are being produced per day. So you're watching a great supply crunch as an investor to look at. And I think it's just perfect timing with the demand growing the way it is. Again, 71% of Bitcoin has not moved in nine months. These are not people sitting on Bitcoin. They're people like me who buy every couple of weeks, or if it dips, I buy a little more and I keep it in my, my vault. Uh, ETFs and pensions and now institutions, also governments and nation states are getting involved. Uh, I personally know that yesterday a gentleman met with 40 states, 40 different U.S. states talking about purchasing Bitcoin on behalf of the state. Uh, I was at Bitcoin 2024 when Donald Trump said very boldly, don't sell your Bitcoin. And he has a plan in place if he's president to purchase 1 million Bitcoin from the market to use as a national stockpile. So many other uses for Bitcoin beyond money. I can go into that into an episode on the, on the podcast, but for today... Understand that demand is growing while supply is depleting. Super important. Now we're watching the growth of peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, until now, Bitcoin has been kind of a peer-to-peer, -peer, but more of a store of capital. But peer-to-peer -peer is growing. Donald Trump just bought a hamburger in New York City with Bitcoin using the Lightning Network, uh, which I thought was fantastic. And then you also have inflation, interest rates, and international sanctions. People ignore this all the time. Uh, central banks in what we consider hostile countries uh, they've been stockpiling on gold and the gold supply is running out. So now they're stockpiling on Bitcoin because they can use it as a way of using cross-border payments without going through the U.S. dollar, the SWIFT system, or any centralized control from the sanctions. And then concerns of privacy and censorship are very much on the rise, as they very much should be, with all the conversation happening in the world about a potential CBDC, which is not potential, it's potential here. Uh, but there are CBDCs being implemented in five different countries in Europe, and most of Asia is preparing to, to launch out CBDCs, which is truly the end of financial freedom. So we have all this supply and demand crunch, and, and the supply and demand is just overwhelmingly simple to see. But how has Bitcoin performed when things go into crisis? You know, we are, pro we are very much in a crisis mode, hostile election, you know, violence overseas, wars, things like that, collapsing economies all, all throughout the world. 
how has Bitcoin performed? I, this is a, a this was actually put out by BlackRock two days ago, and it's a very good breakdown. So we're approaching an election season. The last election season, it was pretty easy to see. Ten days after the election, Bitcoin was up nineteen percent. After after sixty days of the election, Bitcoin was up one hundred and thirty one percent. Uh, I think that had a lot to do with the, the the changing of the guard and the potential of what we're seeing now, fallen economies and and, and poor economic performance. Uh, invasion of, of Ukraine, that produced negative six in 10 days from, from the initiation of the war. Uh, after 60 days, Bitcoin was up 15%. Uh, keep in mind that the, the, your savings account still produced two or 3% at that time, so it was a very small amount. And our U.S. regional banking crisis from last year with Silicon Valley Bank, you saw a 32% jump over a 60-day period. Uh, so I don't like when people say it's a safe haven or a hedge against inflation. Bitcoin doesn't really have any correlation. It is its own independent financial system and the only alternative that exists in the world to central banking. And you're still able to front run. I think the most fascinating thing about Bitcoin is the fact that it was created for the people by the people. And I'll get into the conspiracy theories about Bitcoin at the end. But the mere fact of the matter is the system launched in 2009 and until the last really six or seven months, it was almost completely owned by individuals. And now, even after all the ETF buying, you know, there are six or seven different states buying Bitcoin in, in their pension funds. Almost every government in the world is buying the ETFs as part of their pensions and endowments. They just haven't released that publicly. And now we're still at 60% of Bitcoin is still owned by individuals. 19% is on exchanges, whether that's available for sale or not. If you have Bitcoin on an exchange, get it off of the exchange. These are not secure environments. They're highly centralized and easy to hack. 10% uh, of the uh, overall Bitcoin, this is two months ago, was owned by the miners. The miners have been selling privately to the institutions, keeping the price down while they filled their bags. Uh, I can prove that six ways to Sunday. So that time is almost over as well. So you have a supply crunch. Uh, miners don't have much to sell privately uh, outside of the exchanges. And the exchange uh, supplies are also dwindling. But it's the first trillion dollar asset in the history of mankind where the little guy got a shot at it before the big banks and the nation states. So that's a pretty good description of, of, of Bitcoin, where it is. And it's so important to make it simple to understand Bitcoin is nothing more than open source protocols that act like a, like a, a, a quality control, quality assurance assembly line to ensure that everything is legitimate and that everything is recorded with, with full uh, immutability, can't be changed, and full transparency to the public. That's a very important thing to understand. Now, Michael Saylor, who is the CEO of MicroStrategies and one of the most successful investors in the world, was much like me. Uh, until 2020, he thought Bitcoin was really dumb. And once you really started to see what was happening with inflation beginning and watching the the debacle we've seen in our, our economy over the past year or three or three and a half years, uh, people have gotten more interested in understanding how do I protect my wealth and keep it safe from, from thieving hands of a government. So Michael Saylor recently came out. I saw him speak in Nashville as well. Uh, he has just given a target of Bitcoin at $13 million by 2040. And to be honest with you, uh, five years ago, that would have been a ridiculous claim. And today it's actually pretty mathematically sound when you look at the supply, the demand, and then the decrease in all fiat currencies throughout the world. It's really actually a pretty logical and fairly conservative projection by 2040. Uh, in the end, I believe that I'll get that in the end. Uh, it's also used as with full legal clarity as a treasury reserve asset for corporations. Uh, there are now 65 different public companies that are housing Bitcoin as a way to produce shareholder returns. All of these companies have gone up 30 or 40 percent because they're protecting their com company's wealth against inflation and debasement. So it's being used by corporations. Governments are doing this. Uh, many, many nation states throughout the world are very involved in Bitcoin. In fact, El Salvador is the most well-known. Uh, they made Bitcoin legal tender about three years ago. Three years later, they've now mined millions and millions of dollars of Bitcoin using volcanic energy with no carbon emissions. And that country announced yesterday that they are no longer borrowing money from the IMF or any other foreign entity, that they will fully finance their own independence as a nation. This is a, a movement that will catch on throughout countries, especially smaller ones very soon. Argentina is, is kind of on the same path. Colombia has been talking about it. There's a lot of nation states that are seeing the value in controlling their own destiny as opposed to being beholden to a private central bank. So many governments around the world are doing that. Uh, it will surpass the, the market cap of gold. I've heard everyone say that, and that's what got me interested in Bitcoin because I'm a gold bug by nature. 
and it is pretty mathematically possible. You know, gold is around twelve and a half trillion dollar market cap right now. That's a twelve x from where we are over a fifteen to twenty uh, year term, with the most scarce asset in the world, with really really accelerating demand. I can certainly see that happening. Uh, legal tender is is huge. Ten countries allow it as legal tender for contracts and purchases. The state of Louisiana yesterday just opened up a, a portal on the Lightning Network where you can now pay for your state taxes, your driver's license, anything you want with Bitcoin. The adoption is accelerating faster than I thought it would at this point, uh, which is amazing. But at the end of the day, uh, my opinion, this, these are projections from other people. This last one is me. Uh, at the end of the day, what I see is Bitcoin being used as a pegging instrument. So again, digital gold. We used to use gold as the base layer, and then we would print money against the gold, and you could redeem that printed money for gold. Well, that's extremely difficult to do in today's world. It's expensive. Fuel costs a lot. You don't want banks to have you know, a ton of gold sitting in their vault because they're going to get robbed. You don't want to carry gold around. You're going to get robbed. Uh, I see in the future, and it's not tomorrow, it's down the, down, the, down the line, I see countries that want to create self-sovereignty, ultimately buying big swaths of Bitcoin and then, and then leveraging their own national... National currencies aren't going away. I'm not an, of that opinion. But I do think that instead of, you know, right now it's a fiat world. The only competition you have is your, is your fake money better than my fake money. And that's usually uh, determined by your economy and your military. But in the future, places like El Salvador are working towards using their Bitcoin stockpile to back their own national currency so they don't need to be beholden to a, a, a global world reserve currency. Uh, I see that being the future for national currencies five to 10 years down the road. I think we'll see the first beta test around then. And then ultimately, I think it could be used as a world reserve asset for all currencies to be backed by because it's immutable, scarce, unconfiscatable, uh, and uncensorable. So helpful tips. You know, there's there's a bunch, There's only a few ways to get into Bitcoin. It's not like any other industry. You can either buy Bitcoin by itself. Uh, you can trade it. That's certainly a. I don't trade it. I, I I don't see the point in trading that. I don't. Uh, I will trade any other thing. Uh, you can get involved in trading. You can own it. You can hold it. Or you can get into mining, do it yourself, invest in a miner. It's what I do. I'll do a little tiny thing about that at the end. Uh, or, or you can simply be an observer. Eventually, you'll be able to write options. You can buy an ETF. I advised everyone to own real Bitcoin. Do not buy ETFs that is paper money. This is what they did to gold. Gold used to be something you exchanged on your own that had value. And then they created a paper market. And that paper market has is rife, uh, rife with fraud. In fact, Nine JP Morgan bankers are serving 20 years in prison for rigging the entire metals market over the last 20 years. It's pretty simple. You have one ounce of gold, you sign a contract for one ounce of gold. And since no one ever collects physical gold because it's hard to transport, what these traders do or these entities do is they write a hundred more contracts against that gold because they know people won't ask for the gold. They'll just trade the paper back and forth. That's what the ETFs are. It's not real Bitcoin. Buy real Bitcoin and go to cold storage. These are very small devices that you can use. You can carry around every Bitcoin. You can carry a trillion dollars in, in a little a little device that looks like a flash drive. And remember, there's an old saying, if it's not your keys, it's not your coin. So if you're holding Bitcoin on an exchange, get it off and get it in the cold storage. Don't buy the ETFs. I don't think they're real Bitcoin. And what I do personally, I use what's called multi-sig storage. So not only do I have two devices with my own key phrase where I can access my Bitcoin at any time, I also use a company called Unchained Capital, who's one of our partners. And what they do is they create a storage vault. So my you could break into my home, steal my hard my, my cold wallet, have my passwords written right next to it, and you're still going to have to get permission from me to get my Bitcoin. So I would highly advise at least you know going through, putting our code in, you're going to get a discount on the services, but they'll talk to you for free and explain that to you. Vaulting is very important. Bitcoin will be the most hacked product in the world over the coming year, without question. So protect it as best you can. Now, common FUD, FUD in, in the crypto, the Bitcoin crypto world means creating fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So I'm going to address some of these because I think they're just fun and I don't ever hide from them. I've spent years digging into this. Uh, the one thing I always get is the NSA and the CIA created it. I answer it very simply. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, they created the internet we're talking on now, the microphone I'm using and the camera that we're using right now. So they do make things on an invention basis. But the, the reason I, I think if they did, it might have been people just trying to you know liberate people on their money. Uh, but I get that question all the time. The, the end result is it actually doesn't matter if the devil himself created Bitcoin because he has no control over it anymore. Uh, it is so decentralized and so high powered in computing power 
uh, that is is literally impossible for anyone to rig the system. And, and that's not a, a careless statement. It is literally impossible. And then people say, well, what about the 51% attack? It's true. If someone did gain control of 51% of Bitcoin, they could change all the rules, print more Bitcoin and do what they want. Number one, that would require consensus, which is never going to happen. But the only other way that could be done is through a nation state attack, which means that they would, a nation state or a collaboration of nation states would need the equivalent of energy to produce 641 exohash of power per second. That means that you would literally need to drain all of your oil and gas reserves, put together all your nuclear power, not sell it to anyone. No one could move. You need all that power times three to basically break into the Bitcoin system and change something for a matter of 10 to 60 minutes before all the decentralized node holders kicked you out. I mean, it's really actually almost impossible to hack the system. And then I get it's not backed by anything. I get that all the time. It's not backed by anything. Well, neither is the money you use today. It is backed by sound monetary policy, scarcity, demand. And some people say energy because it takes about $30,000 in energy to produce a $60,000 Bitcoin. That's the prices on our mind. Some people have $50,000, $60,000 fees uh, or cost. So it's not backed by anything except for scarcity, sound monetary policy, the most secure system in the world, and an immutable public open sourced ledger which is more valuable than gold. So I get that a lot. It's too slow and expensive. This is really not a problem uh, in the world. I hear this is, uh, this is what the every crypto company who says they have a better Bitcoin because they have a CEO and investors. Uh, most of them are pump and dumps. That's just a simple fact. I'd be happy to argue with anyone about that and show them exactly how they work. Uh, well, I'll do that. So if you don't mine it, it's not worth anything. Crypto, if you see something that has a pre-mine, it is an altcoin. It is garbage. Uh, a pre-mine is a crafty way of saying we just printed it, but we're going to call it mining so it sounds valuable. They pre-mine, they give it to the investors, the shareholders, the CEO, the employees, and then they hire marketing people to create demand for this coin, and then they sell it into the market. They profit, you lose. End of story. That's the most common thread in crypto. Uh, but they all say that Bitcoin is too slow and expensive, which is actually not untrue. So on layer one, pure Bitcoin, uh, it is pretty slow. It could take up to 10 minutes to process a transaction, and it could be quite expensive. However, Bitcoin, in my opinion, has gone past the peer-to-peer -peer network into a store of capital and used for large transactions. I will buy my next house in cash using Bitcoin. Uh, that will cost me a few dollars, and if it takes 10 minutes, I'm okay with that because the money is sound. Speed and cost is what got us into this terrible situation we're in now, when digital money was created in 1979 called the uncredit card when credit cards launched that was digital money it's fast and it's expense cheap so i don't mind slow and expensive if i don't get debased every minute that i'm alive i, I, I think most bitcoiners agree with that it's actually not a, a bug of the system it's a feature i actually want it to be slow so that all the transactions are recorded perfectly and I don't mind if it's expensive because, as I said, I can buy my house for 21 Bitcoin instead of 43 Bitcoin. If it costs me $6 to transact, I'm okay with that. Poor user experience, I can't deny that. The great company called Lightning right now, great developers, brilliant people. Uh, they are creating a layer two project, which makes uh, transactions much faster and much cheaper. So layer one is expensive. Layer two is what you'll use kind of like a credit card with your phone. And then you commonly hear that Bitcoin has no utility, but my altcoin has the greatest utility. Fantastic. That might have actually been a lot of the other crypto projects are faster and cheaper, but the native currency and their security don't even compare. Uh, proof of work is what we use, create security. Proof of stake is very vulnerable to attacks. So the, the claim of no utility for money is a ridiculous claim because it is money. I can send it to you within a few seconds, a few minutes. I can pay a little money to do it, but I can ensure that I'm sending you sound money anytime, any place in the world. So that's what I've got for Bitcoin. That's kind of condensing down years of research and multiple books and conversations and, and conferences and, and private meetings and conversations with people. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, we're at SovereignCapital.com. Just fill out a form. We'll get back to you. We focus in on private mining deals. I actually don't believe in the public mining sector. I think it's very anti-Bitcoin. Uh, but we focus on private mining deals that you'll use fiat currency to invest in. And you'll be paid in Bitcoin. And it is it is designed to create tax write-offs. So we our project right now, we're actually working with a group in Kentucky that has 111 oil wells. And we're taking their byproducts and creating an off-grid mining system right now that'll provide about a 60% write-off against passive income, along with producing Bitcoin in the long term for, for you. It gets paid out every month. 
Uh, we can also help you out with vault building with Unchained Capital. So if you're just new to Bitcoin and uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a do it yourself guy. I use, I use Unchained Capital for absolutely everything. They're fantastic. Uh, we can help you set you up with them to help you build a vault to protect the Bitcoin that you may buy in the future. And if you want to stay in touch with me and, and follow along with what's happening in money, politics, and religion around the world, I'm at the Rice Report on YouTube, Rumble, TikTok, and I think Twitter is coming up next week. Um, so that is kind of what I've got for you here today, guys. I am. I am a converted uh, gold bug to Bitcoin. And to be honest with you, uh, it's been the greatest decision of my life because I can literally pack up and leave anywhere in the world with all of my money in a hard drive and show up somewhere else and buy whatever I like. And I think that that type of freedom is something we should all experience. It's so interesting that you're speaking just before our gold speaker. <laughs> I love gold. I love, I have gold. I, I didn't sell my gold. I, so uh, about 30% of my portfolio of liquid portfolio is gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. Uh, that is money I can touch and feel. I love gold. I, I, I am not a uh, maxi only person. I mm -hmm. still have gold. I still have a vault. I have plenty of guns to protect my vault also. Uh, I just see that right now, I, I do think, and I talk about it all the time. I think gold will hit 3000 by the end of the year. I, I really do. And I see gold going to five or 6,000 in the next couple of years based on geopolitical events. Uh, I own that because gold, I won't lose money with gold. Like I have to have gold. That's where I, I, I store my wealth. I'm not going to lose money, but I also don't want to sit all in gold. That's how I came to Bitcoin. I have to have some digital exposure. That's where I was in 2020, 2021. I have to have exposure to the digital world. And Bitcoin provided provides massive upside, but it's also very volatile. So Bitcoin, the, the theory of Bitcoin going to zero, I canceled that out, Sarah. So I already have a market order for all 21 million Bitcoin at one penny. So if it did fall down there, Eric Rice would own 21 million Bitcoin for $210,000. Um, <laughs> but everything is a blend. So you need real estate. I tell people all the time, uh, I my, my six picks as a macro investor, gold, silver, raw land. I think raw land is very valuable and low taxes. Oil and gas, private oil and gas investments with tax deferment, Bitcoin, and then the sixth one I've added is the VIX, the VIX. The VIX is the counter to the stock market. So the only money I have in the stock market is actually in the commodities market, is the VIX. So when the market crashes, the VIX goes up and it's pretty simple volatility index. Uh, but in, I'm not the guy who says, put all your money in Bitcoin. Uh, I'm not there yet. So for me, I just look at it as my digital future and exposure to the upside with the same properties of gold, just a little more advanced in the digital world. Love gold. Listen to them. I'm going to listen to them. I love gold and I probably <laughs> will invest.